Hey everyone, welcome to week 5. This is going to be a bit of a long one, so just strap in. Yeah, the good news is that um, immediately after this week we've got a flex week, so you've got a chance to catch up on all the content uh, that you might want to catch up on. So don't worry too much if you don't get through this this week. You've got assignment 1 due now anyway, so I would rather you concentrate on that rather than trying to catch up on this. So depending on how far you've got on that, if you're not very close to finishing yet, I recommend shutting this off and getting back to working on assignment 1. Good luck! <laughs> anyway, uh, with that out of the way, let's get started on this. Uh, this is a continuation of part 1, obviously, of uh, modalities of interaction. And just a bit of a recap over here. We have uh, Milgram's uh, reality virtuality continuum, and um, we have a bunch of uh, different types of interactions, different modes of interactions that's uh, littered along the continuum. Uh, ones in bold are the ones we had a look at. We broke down the various components, and then we saw what's special about them, what kind of trade offs they've had to make to concentrate on their particular uh, niche. Now, if we were to list out all the different modes of interaction that we currently have, this would immediately blow up into something pretty huge that we can't really manage. So it's useful to put this, all this confusion into some kind of framework. And if you study enough of these things, you'll notice that it falls into this uh, the rough kind of pattern. You might have seen something like this before, uh, maybe not exactly the same, but something like it. This is just my own interpretation of my uh, own experience throughout having to deal with a lot of these different systems. This is by no means the definitive model for all of immersive uh, interactions. Think of this as a starting point, and if you have contributions to make to this model, uh, pl please share it with the rest of the class, let us know. Maybe you'll be like, oh, there's a gap over here, Matt, maybe we should add something else over there. We didn't think about this other thing, how does the model incorporate that? So please don't think of this as gospel truth that will never change. Now with that disclaimer out of the way, let's go through this model, let's see how useful it is. Let's have a quick stroll around the diagram. Let's start with the smiley face, right there in the very middle, which is our user. And then you'll see there's like a little cycle thing happening there. From our user, we've got our state tracking systems. This is the part that tells us what our user is currently doing, where they're looking at, what they're holding, or where their hands are at, their body posture, if they have anything that they're saying at the moment. If we're lucky enough, we might even have access to their brain waves, or any other type of neuroelectrical signals that they might be giving off, like muscle signals around uh, your wrists to know how your hands are oriented, or um, I think heartbeat counts as neuroelectrical signals, so let's just say heartbeats. And I'm catching myself getting sidetracked here a little bit, so let's get back to it. So essentially we need to know what our user is currently doing. This information is then fed to our interaction control systems, so we can then decide what to do with all that information. This interaction control system would not only take data from our user, but any number of other things, like maybe it needs to keep track of other characters within the interaction system, within the immersive environment. Maybe it needs to keep track of objects, it definitely needs to keep track of terrain, if that's something that uh, our design calls for. If it needs to communicate with other external systems, then it's going to do that, and just by the very nature of things, this singular interaction control system that we're referring to now would of course be made up of even smaller subsystems working together to become a whole. So it's not really just one thing, we just think of it as one thing. We can nitpick the details to death, but let's pull back a little bit and just think of this as an abstract uh, construct called the interaction control system. And essentially, it's where we decide what to do with the information that we take. Once we've made the decision, though, we need to feed that back to the user. And we then have any number of ways to get that back to the user. There's a lot of emphasis on visual feedback. 
So there's a lot of work on displays and all sorts of magic associated there. Sound is a thing and so are haptics. Feedback in this case is something a little bit more direct, uh, something more sensory. So it's not like feedback in terms of, hey, here's a form and then fill it out and then we'll do something about it. It's more uh, immediate. And of course, this is the sort of thing that you study in 9901. Uh, but for now, let's just uh, wrap it up in this concept of sensory feedback. So we take the sensory feedback, give it back to the user. They react. They use their own agency to do whatever they need to do. And then we, as the designer, would keep track of whatever they're doing through our state tracking systems and then the whole cycle goes around in a circle all over again. Does that sound pretty reasonable? So in this slide, I tried very hard not to mention any specific technologies that are involved in any of these steps. In fact, we don't even need any technology. We can apply this model to real life situations with no virtual objects to deal with whatsoever. We can apply this to restaurants. So let's, let's just do this really roughly. We have the user, they're standing there at the front of the door. Now let's consider everything in the restaurant to be our domain as immersive designers. That includes the tables, the chairs, the employees, and, and the, the rooms. So we notice the user at the front of the restaurant. Uh, that's our tracking, uh, state tracking system. Our standard operating manual says that we need to go greet the customer. So this represents the interaction control system. Now having decided to greet the customer, we go ahead and open our mouth as the maitre d' representing the restaurant, which is the sensory feedback. The user then receives this feedback and they can decide whether to continue with this uh, experience, uh, continue with this transaction, or turn around and leave. If the user decides to stay, the whole interaction cycle goes again. You can apply the same principles to when they're ordering food, or uh, making a complaint, or asking questions. Now, you'll notice that modern restaurants obviously use technology, so they'll have like the uh, iPads or whatever, or maybe they'll have those um, uh, portable payment tappy things, a notepad. And that's not even counting the things that we don't see, like say for example the kitchen, where I'm sure they use all sorts of fancy schmancy cooking type tech. Like I'm, I'm just imagining like a flamethrower or something that uh, perfectly cooks your steak or something. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I guess also not all restaurants cover up their kitchen, so places like Chef's Gallery and Din Tai Fung have glass windows into the kitchen, so you have some insight into that. Um, but that's what we call transparency in the human autonomy teaming uh, business. Anyway, getting sidetracked again, the picture that I was trying to paint there was the, the this concept of interaction control system that we have is actually made up of lots of other little things that come together to form a coherent design. And it's our job as immersive designers for that coherent design to come through. It also helps us a lot to know what kind of information that we're able to take advantage of. So it's also important for us to know what the state tracking systems are. And by the same token, it's also important for us to know what's available for us in terms of sensory feedback. And all this together results in, hopefully, if we've done things right, a good, nice, immersive experience for our user. And they'll come back to our restaurant. And of course, I'm not really talking about restaurants. I'm talking about immersive design and immersive systems in general. And I know things can get really overwhelming at times. There's just a lot of technology and things out there that we can put together uh, and recombine to create uh, any number of compelling immersive experiences. But, you know, if we were also a restaurant owner, we... <laughs> We have the same issue, we have a lot of, there's tons of different types of foods and ingredients, uh, there's any number of uh, cooking styles, and there's a billion chefs out there, and there's different traditions of um, how to do service, 
and um, a good restaurant designer will need to know all the different aspects of these things not necessarily specific details they don't necessarily need to be the ones doing the cooking but they need to know what the cooking tastes like and how it affects you know, the rest of the design how it fits in the whole restaurant so for the rest of this lecture I propose we look at uh, ingredients that we can put into our conceptual restaurant and the conceptual restaurant being our immersive design practice. So let's look at eye tracking. Where does this fit in that framework that we talked about from the previous slide? That was I think the third slide by the way so from now on let's refer to that as slide 3. So where does eye tracking actually fit in the slide 3 framework? And I'll have to ask you to indulge me, I know you know the answer, but I'd just like us to break this down a little bit. Going through this activity will help us uh, tease out some of the issues, especially if we encounter something that doesn't quite fit into these distinct categories. So let's start with something simple like eye tracking. Does eye tracking give the user information or does it take information from the user? Does it make any decisions? And just to be clear, we're only looking at the eye tracking systems here at the moment. It's possible for eye tracking information to be used in other situations, but we're only looking at the eye tracking. And what can the eye tracking do? Most eye tracking systems these days consist of a bunch of infrared cameras that look straight into our eyes. It can then have a look at our irises and by extension it can have a look at the size of our pupils. It can also see where the iris is looking uh, comparatively in contrast to the whites of our eyes. So we can kind of already tell this is very biometric key, biometric like. Let's just say it's very biometric. It literally measures something to do with our bodies. That's biological. But this description is very low level and raw. What information does it actually give us? Well, it gives us something called a gaze vector. And if you could just imagine laser beams coming out of your eyes uh, and then eventually ending up somewhere, that's, uh, that's basically what a gaze vector gives us. And this is very useful because we can use that to know what our user is looking at. We can know what our user is looking at in the virtual environment. We can know what our user is looking at in the real environment, if um, they can actually see through into the real world. So this is very useful from an interaction design standpoint because it's like we now have access to someone's mouse cursor. We know what they're hovering over. Uh, so we could use it for something like object selection. If we're representing virtual avatars for our users in virtual reality, we can then just directly translate their eyeballs. If it's in a multi-user environment, then that would mean that the avatars in that environment have eyeball gaze visible by all the other users collaborating in that environment which would then make it a little bit more natural to interact with each other. Uh, evolutionarily, eye gaze is a really important subconscious cue that we detect, uh, but certainly it would make the experience much more immersive because we now have an extra social cue that we would normally have in the real world. In interactions that lack eye tracking for avatar representation, what we usually have is just uh, where people's heads are pointing. But if we add eyeballs to that as well, that's a free win. I won't dwell on this too much because it is quite subtle, but if you were just to confirm this by looking up the evolutionary role of social eye gaze, uh, hopefully that convinces you. It's, it's really quite important in terms of human interaction. Uh, but moving on, we can also use eye tracking data to measure someone's cognitive load and maybe even stress. So we can get this information just by looking at pupil, di pupil, uh, pupil dilation, pupil dilation. Sorry, one more time, pupil dilation. <laughs> if the pupil is opened up particularly wide, that means that uh, we're processing 
quite a bit of information at that same time and we're trying to gather as much light into our eyes as possible to enhance uh, our situational awareness. Basically it just shows that something has our attention and we're concentrating on it. We can also tell a lot by the variability of uh, pupil dilation and also where our gaze is going. So if someone's moving across uh, really, really quickly, like scanning a page or scanning a particular field of view, uh, maybe they're looking for predators or something like that. So while we can't really tell what someone is exactly thinking by looking at their eye movements, we can infer some of their mental state. And this is very useful from an interaction design standpoint because we can take advantage of that, right? So if we're making a horror experience and we're not getting those stress indicators from our user, uh, we can then dynamically increase the amount of stressful stimulus in, in our um, experience. So let's say Jurassic Park, the T-Rex isn't scaring people enough, so you add in another T-Rex in there or something, or maybe snakes. On the other end of the spectrum, maybe it's a relaxing app, a meditation app, and then we would want the opposite, right? Like we would want all the stress indicators to actually go down and make the environment more relaxing. I'm mentioning all these different things because you really get to appreciate how we can now have the power to create super compelling interactive experiences. Now, in the past, if you were a filmmaker or um, you maybe you're writing a novel, uh, you needed to have some kind of insight into how people thought, what their emotional responses were, and then you would use tools in your wheelhouse to elicit those responses. But you just had to trust that those responses worked uh, just from your own experience and your own uh, craftsmanship. Uh, but now we actually have access, direct access, to people's emotional states and uh, we can kind of cheat a little bit. And that's just from a very blunt instrument like stress and uh, cognitive load. We don't necessarily need to take advantage of this in a entertainment or fictional experience. We could also use it in a more productive uh, industry type uh, application for immersive design. Like let's say you're a mining technician or someone in an unsafe environment like a construction site or even a warehouse. We can combine the stress and workload indicators with something more concrete like the gaze-based information. So we not only know what our users are looking at, we also know how roughly stressed they are. So we can use this as a kind of measure of situational awareness. So if you're in a forklift, and um, let's say someone had an augmented reality headset on and they were using our app. We could use the information coming in from the cameras uh, looking outside to notice any obstacles. Let's say um, another teammate that's walking across the um, uh, path of the forklift. That's a super dangerous situation, right? So if we detect that uh, our forklift driver isn't actually looking at the teammate that's walking across uh, and we also detect that uh, the forklift driver is experiencing high stress or workload levels and we can do something about it. We can give them an even higher warning to say hey there's someone in there or we can even intervene like if uh, our augmented reality app is somehow connected to the forklift we can just stop the forklift and then give a very stern warning to the forklift driver and say, hey, uh, pay more attention, stop looking at 9gag on your phone or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm catching myself again, it's getting to be a bit of a hand wavy rant, uh, but the, the picture that I wanted to try and paint uh, for you guys was that uh, you can actually do a lot of this stuff just by this eye tracking information that we're getting. And from a slightly higher level, uh, this shows that it's really worth knowing what our ingredients are to be able to really take advantage of them uh, from an interaction design standpoint. And uh, the ingredients being all the tools that we have. And in this case, we're just looking at uh, eye tracking. So maybe you've come up with some ideas of your own already. And if you have, we'd love to hear about it. So please post it in the forum just randomly. I'll give you 200 kudos points for starting a thread with 
as some kind of idea that you have. So I sense a little bit that we've spent quite a bit of time on eye tracking, but before we move on to the next thing, I just wanted to quickly mention that we can also use eye tracking information for more direct sensory feedback. So what we've been talking about just now would be a little bit higher level. So when I say that, I mean things that are slightly just a little bit further down the line from when we sense something. So all those affordances, being able to know what our user is looking at, for example, and then doing something about it, like object selection, that's, uh, that's an affordance. But we can also use eye tracking information to enable and enhance uh, quote unquote sensory hacks. So one really favorite thing of mine is uh, dynamic foveated rendering. Now, we talked about foveated rendering and um, just as a bit of a reminder, it's where we render um, th uh, the graphics in the middle of our vision at full resolution. Outside of that uh, narrow band of full resolution, we don't render it as high. And people will still perceive the same quality image, but we're not spending uh, quite as many, uh, quite as much computing resources. So that's a cool hack that enables higher frame rates, less motion sickness, and that kind of thing. But what we've talked about so far has just been fixed foveated rendering. That is, we're just assuming where the user is actually looking at in the screen. So. Now that we have eye tracking information, what we can actually do is follow where the user really is looking at and move around where the full resolution is being rendered. So in fixed foveated rendering, if the user looks away from uh, our assumed center of vision, then uh, th they'll see blurry things. But with eye tracking, the user can just move their eyeballs anywhere inside our headset and uh, the full resolution will still follow them because we're actually uh, following them with eye tracking. So that's really cool, isn't it? We can also use eye tracking to manipulate what objects are being focused in our display. As of right now, the year 2022, most of the displays that we have access to are what we call flat single focus displays. And for most situations, this is perfectly fine, but we suspect that there might be a bit of a safety issue in long-term use because we're not shifting focus in our lenses, uh, in our eyes. We're always looking at the same thing. The display doesn't move, so it's always going to be in the same focus. And as a bit of an anecdote, uh, I noticed this in a friend of mine that was playing Robo Recall for hours. And then lunchtime came, we tried to go for lunch, and then she found that she felt a bit funny when walking uh, outside of the headset. If she jumped back into the headset, she walked fine, but when she took the headset off, it was like, what's going on here? And I suspect that it was because her eyes just needed to re-acclimatize to doing dynamic focus in the real world because we need to do that in the real world. And there's a really quick trick we can do to illustrate this. So please just hold up your finger in front of you uh, the moderate distance away from your face and look at your finger, uh, the tip of your finger. Uh, you'll notice that the background is blurred, but your finger is completely focused. Now do the other thing and look away from the finger and look further into the background. You'll notice that your background is now focused, but not your finger. So that, that stuff is what we get for free in the real world. But if you're in a flat display uh, inside a current generation virtual reality headset, you're not gonna see that blurring effect as you look between the background and your finger. Like absolutely everything will be in focus. We still see a perception of depth because we're using the uh, triangulation. You have slightly different images between your left eye and right eye but the focus is exactly the same. So that's kind of a problem, that's kind of a weird thing. If you're in that state for too long and you get used to it, you start to forget how to autofocus in the real world, at least in, in the case of Zian, my friend. So it's a worthwhile problem to solve. 
one way to solve it is just not have flat displays and use what's called light field displays. And I've posted links to those in the Discover section. But um, another way to solve this problem is just look at what we're looking at uh, in terms of eye tracking data and change the focus on the screen artificially based on what you're gazing at. There's another variation to this. You can also use eye tracking information to actually change the focal lengths or the focus distance of the displays physically as well as on the display as well in terms of the image that you're showing. And all this is just based on the eye tracking data that you get uh, from knowing what you're actually looking at. And going back to our finger example, the concrete way that this is done is if you detect that your user is looking at the finger, you make the finger focused and blur out the background. And if you detect that your user is isn't looking at the uh, finger but the background, then you, you do the other thing. You make the background focused and the finger blurred. I just thought it was worth mentioning because it is actually a thing, but um, it's not something that we would directly design for because a lot of these would have already been built in to either the game engine or the operating system that we're using. Uh, but uh, it's, it's just good to be aware of these issues. So when one of your friends says that they can't walk right because they're seeing things funny after playing Robo Recall on your VR headset for five hours straight, uh, that you, you will know the cause. <laughs> okay, we've spent a lot of time on eye tracking, so let's go ahead and move on to facial tracking. This should be pretty quick. Many of us would have already experienced this uh, quite often as well. Uh, so an example of this would be Instagram filters or Snapchat filters. I'll, um, even if you're kind of a professional, you'll notice that these filters also exist in Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams. Yeah, basically this is where you overlay funny things uh, on top of people's faces so and we can track faces and put stuff on top of it. We can also see individual facial features. So, so if you smile, you can make the visualization smile too. And if you were representing an avatar, you can make that avatar smile. You can synchronize lips. And um, I guess just in the same way that uh, detecting eyeball gaze and then adding that into the avatar representation, that's just another subconscious uh, social cue that humans use uh, like pretty much unconsciously, uh, I guess unless if you've got Asperger's. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, for most uh, neurotypical people, you would be using these uh, social cues unconsciously and it would just be really good to have these unconscious cues taken uh, into the virtual space if we are using it in the virtual space. And uh, the way to do that is have sensors looking at your face. Yeah, pretty simple actually. Um, I can't think of any direct sensory feedback uh, applications for facial tracking in the same way that eye gaze has, but maybe you can think of some. If you do, you're very welcome to share it in the forum. That would be a really great thing to discuss. But one cool thing that we can use from facial tracking apart from dumb filters is we can have an idea of what people's emotional state is again. So this is going to be a slightly higher resolution than just is someone stressed or not stressed? Is someone focusing their thoughts on something or are they pretty relaxed and ready to receive more inputs? So that's what we get from pupil dilation and uh, eye motion. But with facial tracking, we can get people's emotions somewhat. When you see someone smile, you've got a pretty good idea that they're happy. There's a good chance that this is true. When you see someone frowning, uh, then you know you can kind of tell that they're upset about something. Or if uh, they're showing their teeth and their eyebrows are turning into a bit of a V you know that uh, they're somewhat angry about something and maybe they're about to attack you. Now for most of us these are very intuitive things. 
and they're intuitive because we've evolved with them for such a long time. And a lot of these reactions are involuntary, actually. So that's why we have this expression, you should have seen your face, like, uh, I don't know, when we surprise someone or like on a do, do a pretty good prank. Uh, so you, you should have seen your face when I did blah. And yes, we can consciously control our facial expressions. And I think in some circles we call it acting or something like that. <laughs> Uh, just go across the street to NIDER if that's the thing that you want to do. NIDER is the National Institute for Dramatic Arts, so that's when you, that's where you go when you want to cause drama. Sorry, um, do drama, not cause drama. But yeah, um, t taking all the jokes aside, facial reactions are an unconscious reaction to things, and us as designers can take advantage of that by looking at our users' facial reactions, and then tailoring our experiences based on that, in a similar way to how we discussed it um, for managing stress and cognitive load in uh, the eye tracking. And now that we have a much fuller range of emotional tracking, this is called affect tracking, we can do something like affect synchronization, where we basically match our experience with our users' emotional states, whatever our design may be. And that's, uh, that's something that hasn't really been done too much, so it'd be really good if us in this class would do stuff like this and get famous for doing it. And uh, we really have this opportunity, that's why this field is super exciting. Now, having said that, facial tracking and also eye tracking is not very commonly available right now, and right now is March 2022. But it's, it's, it's good to know that these things are available now so we can start designing for it. Uh, it's still within the specialist domain. The equipment you need to get is a little bit expensive, but it opens us up to designing really powerful experiences. And when I say equipment, uh, I don't necessarily mean uh, you know tech. This stuff is already happening in theme parks. So if you were to go to, say, Walt Disney World over in Florida, you'll see a bunch of actors pretending to be uh, characters from the stories, but uh, they're not acting out a particular play or a particular scene in the play. They're walking amongst the public, uh, the, the users of this immersive experience, which means you can actually interact with them dynamically as if you were talking to those fictional characters in the real world. Uh, now, their reactions to you is constrained by stricts and you know rules and things like that, but but it it gives you that illusion, right? And the only way they can do that is because they're able to assess your state uh, and like you know look at where you're looking, have a look at your face, how you're reacting to them, listen to what you're saying, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's it's a really powerful experience when when you do have it, right? Because it's like it's you're not just sitting there watching a film; you're participating in it. I mean, that, that's that's pretty amazing, right? It's amazing. <laughs> but we have a limitation. The only people that can design for those experiences are the employees of those multi-million-dollar theme parks, because we need to hire actors. We need to hire um, people who build props and costumes and things like that. The cool thing about having them virtual is uh, basically everything becomes free, almost. The only thing that we need to pay for is production of um, the digital assets, and then once it's there, we have it perpetually. And our audience expands exponentially. It's not just the people that can afford to go to these venues, uh, you know, pay for accommodation and tickets to get into the theme park. It's it's everyone, and that's the opportunity that we have right now. I mean, it's not quite here yet, but you can see it coming. It's coming soon. And I'm probably preaching to the converted, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop preaching. Uh, and uh, that, that's a very optimistic vision of um, uh, biometrics in immersive design. 